God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. Luke 12, 49 and 50 and John chapter 4 and we'll read from verse 34. I am come to send fire on the earth and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with and now I am straightened until it be accomplished. Now go to John chapter 4, verse 27. And we'll go on to verse 38. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went away into the city and says unto the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not? Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, A certain man brought him ought to eat Jesus says unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work say not ye there are yet four months and then come at harvest behold I say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white or ready to harvest. And he that reaped received wages, and gathered fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And here is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye have entered into their labors. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts, even tonight, in the name of Jesus. We're looking at the burning passion of Christ. The burning passion. When we read Luke and we saw Jesus saying, I have come to set fire on the earth. And where would I if it is already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. In the morning I was looking at the baptism that is requisite for world revival. The baptism that was requisite for the release of God's fire on the earth. By the time we are concluding, we are noting that even though Jesus was personally prepared, 
and he was personally certified and the prince of darkness came all through to see whether I could find something as to discredit him or silence him but he found none and for the ministry that he executed while he was here he carried a certificate of life that the devil cannot contradict and everywhere he went we saw that the kingdom of God was being imposed and of course Satan was unable to withstand him but we saw that if this is going to overwhelm the entire earth and if this is going to be a final takeover of the nations from the principalities that were ruling them there's a baptism and I said that baptism into death is the baptism that destroyed the power him that had the power of death that is Satan who uses the fear of death to keep men in bondage but then the second thing that that death was to do was to terminate the enemy within us Mr. Flesh and to abolish it so that we also could be presented and say this is my beloved son this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well placed there's nothing in him anymore that is contrary to my will that was where we stopped before we went to pray now what I'm drawing was what Jesus Christ said to his disciples in verse 32 and he said I have meat to eat that you know not of and the disciples were speaking one to another has any man brought him something to eat and Jesus now says to them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work but where we are going to pray is that God will open our eyes to individually be able to discover what meat the master has to eat it was very very painful that these disciples have followed the Lord and they have traveled together with him and they came to this particular well and the Bible said Jesus being wearied in his journey he sat on the well and so the disciples they went away to the city to buy something to eat they went to buy meat and it will have appeared as if what Jesus was waiting on that well for was the meat they went to buy isn't it because they said he was wearied with his journey and so he sat on the well tired and the disciples had gone to the town to go and look for something to eat and it appears as if that was what Jesus wanted to eat only for them to come back and they say master here is your meat will you not eat for them to hear a very very serious I don't know how to put it but I think it's a rebuke I have meat to eat 
that you know nothing about. I was hungry for something. You went for something else. I was longing for something. What I had appetite for is not what you brought for me. They went everywhere. Maybe they went through the whole city. They went from one Mr. Big to another, I don't know. Looking for something they thought would be, I mean, a sumptuous and presentable to their Lord. Only for Jesus to say, I have meat to eat that you don't know anything about. I'm not ready to eat what you are bringing. I want you to please catch this because I feel we will just make it a matter of prayer. I feel that the first thing we are going to be saying, Lord, show me your appetite. Please hear me. Lord Jesus, show me your appetite. Don't let me travel all life to bring back to you what you have no appetite for. Don't let me spend my time. Don't let me spend my days. Don't let me spend my opportunities. Don't let me spend my the grace that you have poured into my life only to bring to you what will never appeal to your appetite. And as I'm looking at what is the burning passion of Jesus, I continuously began to discover that unless God helps each one of us, we might be very busy we might be very occupied. We might be very consumed. And we may be spending so much to bring together that which does not meet its taste. What is it? What is the meat that the master will eat? that we may bend down to look for it for him. Hallelujah. Look, as these brothers went everywhere, to them, they have done something serious. To them, they have gone to meet the need of Jesus. But do you see, Jesus sat by the well. And it will appear as if he was even thirsty for water. When he approached that woman and said, give me to drink. Let me ask you. Throughout their discussion, until the verse that we read, that verse 27, has Jesus drank any water? Did they actually want to drink the water from that woman? What is it that Jesus wanted to drink when he said, give me to drink? What is the meat that Jesus wanted to eat when he said, give me something to eat? What is it? What is his appetite? Let's take it step by step. As that woman came and Jesus said, give me to drink. She misunderstood the appetite of the master. She thought that it is her bucket that Jesus wants to drink from. 
She said, you are a Jew. How can you be asking me for water to drink? And Jesus looked at her and said, if you have known the gift of God, and if you have known he who is asking you to give him to drink, what will you have done? You will have asked me to give you my own water. And the water that I would have given you will have become a well. Oh, the woman said, you, where will you get that water? You don't have a bucket. And the well is deep. And Jesus said, whosoever drink of this, we thirst again. But whosoever will drink of the, of the water that I shall give him, he will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well, a spring of living water, springing up unto everlasting life. It was this issue that brought that woman to the point where she said, Ah, give me this water that I may not come here to draw again. Maybe she was sarcastic. And Jesus said, go and call me your husband. So let me ask you, when Jesus was asking that woman, give me something to drink, do you know that Jesus wasn't concerned about the water that she's carrying up and down? Where does Jesus want to drink from? From her life. Sometimes, People come and they think what matters to God so much is things, properties, money. They don't understand that though money may look important, money is not his appetite. What is his appetite? Your very life. Give me to drink. I see Jesus all the time say, Give me something from your life to drink. I am thirsty for something. I am thirsty for something I want to drink from your hand. I want you to give me something that will satisfy my hunger and my thirst. As this woman never understood yet, she thought it is this well. So when she now began to realize that this man that is talking to me is different, said, can you give me your own water? I said, no, go call me your husband. I have no husband. You say, yes, it's true. You are telling the truth now. You have no husband. You had five husbands before. And now you are in the house of number six. And even that number six is not your husband. No be so. The woman said, ah! It looks as if you are a prophet. Now let me tell you. When the woman exclaimed, it seems as if you are a prophet. Even that does not satisfy the appetite of Jesus. Sometimes you think that giving Jesus a big, big appellation is what he is thirsty for. Sometimes some of us don't understand that Jesus is not looking for all such sugar-coated worship. So the woman said, ah, our fathers worship on this mountain. But you people say, look, let me tell you, time is coming. It will neither be that mountain or this mountain where they worship the father. For God is spirit. And they that worship him, they do what? They worship him in spirit and in truth. For such the father 
seeketh. The father tasted for to worship him. So what will be the hunger of God if anybody is to worship him? Those who do so, how? In spirit and in truth. So the discussion went on. Don't forget that what started this discussion was what? Give me a drink. Give me something from your life. But suddenly the woman saw that, ah, I have nothing to give this man. I should have asked him to give me something so that I can give him something to drink. So that my life can bring him satisfaction and I can quench his thirst. Brothers and sisters, some of you, you have been coming with the Lord for years. And God has been asking just one question. Give me a drink. Give me something that will satisfy my heart. The Bible said in Isaiah, who will help me read Isaiah 53? 11 and 12, sir. He shall see of the travail of his soul. He will see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. May God be satisfied over your life. There is a longing. There is a test. There is something that is. Jesus is thirsty and he's hungry for something. And he's longing for that from each one of us. And he's saying, give me, give me a drink. I want to drink something from you. I want, to, I want to drink something from your life. Go ahead. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death. death. Yes. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah. He will see the travail of his soul. And he will be satisfied. What will satisfy him? What will quench his thirst? What drink can I give him that will quench the longing of his heart, that will meet his appetite? And as that woman of Samaria came to that point, and Jesus said, Look, it's not about mountain. It's not about going here and going there. It's about those who worship the Father. How? In spirit and in truth. He said, such the Father seeketh to do what? To worship him. At that point, at that point, it looks to me as if the woman knew what will satisfy Jesus. So see her response. In verse 28, the woman left her water pot, went away into the city, and went and says to the man, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? The Bible said, then they went out of the city. And they did what? And they came to him. I don't want you to interrupt our thoughts by going to verse 31. Because verse 31 is in parentheses. They say, in the meantime, in the meanwhile. Have you noticed that? Which means, why this woman was going to get what Jesus would drink. 
what will satisfy Jesus. The disciples that did not know his appetite, they were presenting him with what will spoil his appetite. I don't know whether you understand. You have desire to eat a particular soup and you have ordered for it and they are gone and you are already smelling it. Somebody now came and said eh, eh, there is this soup that I wanted to eat. What do you say to that person? Say no, no, no. I'm sorry. You don't know what I want to eat so keep your soup. I have a soup I want to drink which you don't know anything about so please. By the time this woman was coming back see the result. In verse 39 many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman we testified. He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And they said to the woman, now we believe. Not because of your sin, for we have heard him ourselves. And we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. Now before I go on from there let me ask you throughout this record what did he eat? Let's talk. You remember that we are told that he was weary on his journey. Eh? And it will appear as if he was only tired for the food that those brothers went to buy. But by the time they came back with what they went to buy, they didn't eat it. What was their question? As someone brought food for him, because they suddenly saw that the hunger they saw in his eyes has vanished. They didn't see that on guy again. Today, standard we are saying, has somebody given him something to eat? Why does he not have appetite for what we went to buy? He said, I have meat to eat that you don't know about. I have got what I want to eat. And he defined it. Did he define it in verse 34? What was his definition of his meat? My meat is to do what? The will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's my meat. As we are about to pray, I just wish that for once we will all get on our knees before God and honestly pray and say, Father, Show me your appetite. It might look a very casual prayer that I'm asking you to pray, but I know if God will answer my prayer, it will be a beginning. Lord, write into my heart what is it that you are hungry for? What do you want to get from me? What is it that you are passionate for that I should bring to you? I don't know how to quickly say what I am wanting to say. But I trust that God will give me help so that in a short while we can pray over it. I found that sometime even as we became full-time preachers it's possible to spend your full time doing
doing something that is irrelevant to Jesus. To such a point that he will be asking, I have a meat to eat that you don't know about. I see you traveling up and down here and there. But what you are gathering, I am not interested in it. I'm not interested. It doesn't meet my appetite. It doesn't quench my hunger. That is not my passion. That is not my passion. That is not what I am longing to see. I would like us to pray together and say, Lord, you are asking me, give me to drink. Lord, what kind of drink will you take from my life? What is it that my life must produce to you and you will see the travail of your soul and you'll be satisfied. You know, we used to sing that song. I'm satisfied with Jesus. I am satisfied with him. My faith in him shall never fail. I am satisfied with Jesus. But another hymn writer said, is he satisfied with me? When he sees his travail over my life, is he satisfied? When he sees investment over my life, is he satisfied? When he sees all that he has done to keep me alive, to keep me in the faith. To link me up with people that could have helped my life. Is he satisfied? Is God getting something that quenches his thirst from my own parts? And when that woman went, and he went and brought the people, do you know that for another two days, my master that appears so tired, eh? that he looks as if he was so weary with his journey. How did he have strength to run for another two days? Because he has got the meat that he's looking for. Lord, Lord, what is it that I am doing that does not actually meet with your appetite? I'm occupied. I'm doing it up and down. But it doesn't meet your taste. I wanted you, Lord, to create in me your passion. I wanted you to show me what I will be doing and it will satisfy you. It will quench your thirst. Do you remember that The disciples showed Jesus a very magnificent temple. Do you remember? And they said, look, look at this beautiful thing. They thought that Jesus was going to be impressed. What did they say? So I said to you, a time comes when no stone will be put on top of this. I said to say, that's not what I'm looking for. That will not satisfy me. That will not meet the cry of my heart. The passion, 
the appetite of the master, what is it? I noticed that that woman of Samaria did one thing that met the master's hunger. Did it meet his hunger? Eh? As he went to Samaria and brought all those people, I was wondering, if the disciples as they went everywhere, let's imagine that what they simply did was as they were going, they were saying, come and see the man who had changed our lives. We are brought into this place. He would not normally have passed through here, but he has passed through Samaria. Great things have happened in Judea. Come and see him. Could it be that if those 12 disciples, when they were coming back, they came with people, would they have satisfied his heart? But they came back with bread and Mr. Biggs. And the master says, sorry, I'm not interested. Honestly speaking, I don't know who ate that food. I can tell you, Judas Iscariot must have eaten it. <laughs> yes. I imagine how Judas is saying, hey, if he doesn't want to eat, let's eat it. After all, we have already bought it. Let it not be wasted. I'm sure he must have done that. There are people that though they have come to God, all that concerns them is what they personally benefit. There came a time in our lives that all we look for was what benefited us. But we are coming to a point now where Jesus is saying, give me a drink. Give me something to drink from your life. Give me something that will satisfy my heart. I believe that that's the point our discipleship labor has come to. Are we together? I believe that the discipleship work thank God for all that it has done. But we have come to a point now where Jesus is saying I am about to take a drink. Give me a drink. For several years, he had been pouring, he had been exposing, he had been teaching, he has been doing things, traveling over our lives. Some of us, God, actually put you under people, disciples, who took you in as though you were their child. Some of us, by the grace of God, were sponsored in school because when we came into discipleship, those brothers and sisters saw that, let this sister go to school. And even your parents didn't know anything about it. And God is saying, yes, but now, I did all of that because I want to take a drink. Give me to drink. We have come to that point where God is demanding, can you give me a drink? Can you give me a drink? Can you give me something that will satisfy my heart? That when I look at my travail, my soul will be satisfied. And I'll be able to say, yes, I've got a man there. I've got a sister there. I've got a woman there. They're bringing me what I want to eat. They're no longer coming with problems. Their prayer life has changed. 
they are bringing me something that satisfies my heart. That's why we want to pray that our work with God, our discipleship relationship, our experience of our exposure to God is coming to this point, at least for some of you. God is saying, give me a drink. I have a passion. I have a meat that will satisfy my heart and I want to take it from your hand. But for that woman, at the point that Jesus needed to drink from her life, she didn't have anything. She only came with a confusion. The bucket she carried, there was nothing there. Her argument was because she was empty. And the master said, instead of arguing, you will have asked me, I will have given you water. So that out of you, something will have been breaking for, then I can drink from you. There will be people here who say, Lord, even up to now, I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to show you. But if you give me a drink, you will drink from my life again. There will be people that will say, Lord, I want to give you a drink. I want my life to satisfy you. And I want my life to satisfy you while I am young. When I can actually do something. Don't let it be when everything is finished. And I will not even be able to go anywhere. That you will begin to say. Lord I wish I can go. I wish I can go to the hills. I wish I can go to the creeks. I wish I can go to the city. In order to get you something to eat. Now. As. That woman cried and said. I wish she dropped that bucket and ran. And by the time she was returning, Jesus had enough on his hands. I want you to pray with me and say, Lord, even this discipleship process, your travel over my life will not be in vain. You will drink something from my life also. How many of you will join me to pray that prayer? And you will have something that satisfies your appetite in my life also. But before you go to pray, let us now look at how Jesus answered the disciples. I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore they said, one to another, as every man brought him ought to eat, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to do what? And to finish his work. To do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come at harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that repents receives wages, and gathers fruit unto life eternal, that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. Hear me. Hearing is that saying, one saw it and another reap. I sent you to reap that wherein you bestowed no labor. Other men labored 
and you have entered into their labors. While Jesus was still speaking, eh? the Samaritans have arrived. I don't think he finished what he was saying when the woman of Samaria brought him what to eat. Would you like to say to God, my life and in my lifetime, you will get something that satisfies you. That's a prayer. Lord, while I am alive, and in this, my years, I will give you something. To do what? To drink. Of course, listen, there's nothing you can give to him to drink except out of which he has first of all done what? Given to you. That's the irony of it. We cannot give him anything that he has not first of all put in our lives. So the prayer we want to pray is, Lord, out of the abundance that you have put in my life, you will have something to drink. Something that will satisfy you. If you are a student, how wonderful it is that by the grace of God, God allowed you to be exposed to something like this. That while some of your own classmates have spoiled their lives, God was preserving you. Let me ask you, will God have a drink from your life? Eh? As you are getting to the university, some of you are just going to university. Did you think you are too young to bring something during your university days for Jesus to drink? Eh? I'm talking to you. Do you think you are too young to bring something for him to drink? Having exposed himself to you, having taught you these years. Now, as a young man, now that you are strong, now that you are young, now that you can run, will he have something to drink from your life? And you know the way I'm crying to God? Those of us that Jesus met quite early, I wish he would drink for a long time from our lives. I wish he would drink and drink and drink and say, yes, my investment in this young man is worth it. Give me something to do what? To drink. Give me meat that I want to eat. I want to eat from your life. But from the way he discussed with that woman, he couldn't drink from her until her life had been made correct. Did you notice that? Eh? He couldn't take anything from her while she was still unstable. It was at the point of conviction when her life was turned over that Jesus could take anything from her life. He will drink. But what he wants to drink must be what he has already put inside that you can be released of him. So there are two kind of prayers we want to pray. The first prayer, the first kind of prayer, some of you may not fit into it, some of you may fit into it, but it's all right. First kind of prayer, are you the woman of Samaria? Coming with an empty bucket. Tossed to and fro. Battered. Jumping from one problem to another. And Jesus 
hungry and thirsty. He's looking at you and saying, give me something to drink. He's very strange. Even the woman said, this is strange. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for this? Some of you, you are just walking in from so many battered experiences, challenges, to such a point that some of you are saying, it's not a person like me that God wants to get anything from. I'm a terrible sinner. What good can come out of me? What will I ever get? Let God forget about my case. But I want you to know that God was not going to forget anything about you. The reason is because it's because you are modeled up. Otherwise, you are an instrument through which God will be satisfied. Somebody may be sitting here like Paul of Tarsus. Paul of Tarsus was so destructive. He was so reckless. He did terrible things. Hallelujah. But you see, even when he was consenting for them to kill Brother Stevie, and while he was throwing away churches and scattering the brethren and persecuting the, the church, what he didn't know was that Jesus already saw him as a pot from where he would drink. And as he confronted him on the road to Damascus, something changed about his life. I don't know whether you ever thought how long have we been drinking from that vessel? Eh? Look at thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of people that have been blessed because Paul surrendered to God on the road to Damascus. Eh? Could you imagine that somebody who is a murderer could give God so much to drink? That's why no matter how battered your life is and you are hearing God saying to you, even you, give me a drink. Instead of arguing, do you know what to say to God? Lord, I wish I had something for you to drink. But as I am now, my life is too scattered. Give me your drink. And by the grace of God, your water in me will become a spring that will bring you the satisfaction of your heart. There are people that will pray that prayer. I don't know why the way the Spirit of God is moving me to speak here, there are so much haste about it. As if God is particularly saying, I have numbered you among those that will be a channel for meeting the need of my heart. But for that to happen, for that to happen, you must ask me for a drink. That's the first prayer. The second prayer are those of us who have been disciples, who have been following him up and down. We were with him in Judea, we were with him in Capernaum, we were with him everywhere. But up to now, we don't know the meat. He was looking for. What we are gathering is not what he wanted to eat. Will you pray and say, Lord, right inside of me, create in me a passion for your passion. Give me an understanding of what is it that you have invested so much in my life to bring to you. And don't let my years go without giving you something to drink. You're going to pray and say, let my discipleship and all your travel over my life, let it give you something that will quench your thirst in this generation. 
Is the prayer point clear? Let's go to pray. You may kneel down if you want. You may stand up if it is convenient for you. But let me be sure that you are praying. As a precursor to where God is taking us tomorrow, we are individually saying, open our eyes to discover your appetite and create it in me. Create it in me, oh God. Show me where to apply my life, where to apply my strength, where to apply the grace that you have given me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we plead with you. Do something with us, O oh God, that will cause your purpose to prosper in our lives. Oh God, baka yato robusko, mesha taraba sambo robushi, ika raba sambo robushi ndama kaura masa. Maybe you have been in the ministry, running up and down everywhere, but what you are gathering does not feed his appetite. What you are doing does not meet the travail of his soul. He is not satisfied. I want you to pray and say, Lord, create in me appetite for your appetite. Passion for your passion. Let nothing else satisfy me apart from that which satisfy your heart. Don't let me be involved in anything else except that which is meeting the cry of your heart. Please pray. We are spending the next few minutes to call on God together. I said if you want to be on your knees, you can. If you want to stand up, you can. But let me be sure that you are talking to God. Lord, that I may apply my life to that which satisfies your heart. That which quenches your thirst. And I want to do it now that I'm young. Now that I am strong. Now that I have strength. Now that I have capacity, thank you, Father. I sense that our discipleship process, the discipleship labor, is coming to a point where God is saying, Give me a drink. That every one of you, in whichever place God is allowing you to be exposed, God is about to drink from your hand. God is about to drink from your life. God wants to eat something from your life. And you are going to say, oh God. Let me not continue to run around for anything different from what satisfies your heart. From this time, Lord, you will drink from my hand. You cannot procrastinate, you cannot postpone the time of giving him a drink. Lord, take a drink from my hand as well. 
make a drink, O oh Lord, from my hand as well. Lord, take a drink from my life as well. I wish, Lord, that you would drink from my life deeper than you have ever drunk. I desire, oh God, that when you look at the travail of your soul over my life, When you look at your input into my life, oh God, let the output bring satisfaction to your soul. Lord, I've seen you, you have sent me support. You have provided for my needs. Whatever I asked, you did it. So that you might find something to drink from my life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord, I plead with you. You will have something to take from my life. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. While you are still praying, listen, I just want to read a passage to you. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often on it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receives blessing from God. But that which beareth tongues and prayers is rejected. And is nigh unto Cosi, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. And things that accompany salvation, they will speak like this. Listen. The earth which drinketh in the rain that comes often on it. And bring forth herbs that is meat for them by whom it was dressed. It receives blessing from God. But that one which beareth tongues and prayers is rejected, is near unto cursing, whose end is to be bound. But we are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation. Did you understand that scripture? With the rains that have been coming on your life, with the outpouring of the grace of God on your life, what are you bringing forth for the Master? What are you bringing forth? Are you bringing forth herbs that is meat, that is that is suitable, that meets the appetite of those by whom you have been dressed? Or you are only producing tons and prayers. But we are persuaded of better things concerning you. Things that accompany salvation. After you have been helped, after you have been saved, after you have been delivered, after you have seen the death of the old man, what is it that has accompanied it? What have you brought forth to the Lord? What is he drinking from you? As I call on you to pray, will you say to God, not tongues, not prayers, not disappointments. Lord, you will drink something that is suitable to your appetite for my own life also. Can you pray that prayer before I close? Lord, 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 you have done so much for me. You have taken away my sorrow. You have done so much for me. It 
is not right, O oh God, for me only to produce tongues and prayers. Oh God, you will take a drink from my own life. You will also take a drink from my own life. You will be satisfied with me. You will be satisfied. I will not be a disappointment to you. Lord, let not my life be a disappointment to you. Just pray and say, Oh God, your investment in my life will not be a waste. Your exposure of my life will not be a waste. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036359, 0703-768198. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Make it a date with us next week.